All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back for another awesome episode. I am so glad to bring you another incredible guest. We got Jace Lopez in the house. He's the owner and head coach of Apex Training Gym down in Louisiana. He has several physique athletes that have been super successful. He also trains Gen Pop clients to get some of the most insane results you've ever seen. And this guy's got such insane energy. If you were to put it in a bottle, it'd be the best selling thing in the entire world. Hands down, better than Monster, better than Red Bull in an instant. So Jace, welcome to the show. What an intro, Brian. That's awesome, man. I appreciate it, brother. I'm excited. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm giving Bruce Buffer a run for his money. I'm working yeah, on his yeah. intros. <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So first off, thank you for taking the time. I know you got, like you said, big leg day coming up. So I know when those days come, like when they're properly done, which we're going to talk about in detail, like you need to get in the zone. So we're going to talk a lot about muscle building for anybody listening right now. It's like, listen, I want to put on some lean muscle. I don't want to get too, too fat in the process. I just want to like get a nice shape. This is a hundred percent for you. So before we get into that, Jace, let's tell the people a little bit about you. Like what got you into the lifting and into this beautiful space that is exercise, fitness, nutrition? Yeah. So, I mean, always had a passion for lifting weights. You know, uh, I played football in, in middle school and high school. And I know it's like football is pretty fun, but like the gym was the, like I was first one and last one out, you know. So so mm -hmm. I've always had like a, like a, this like in, internal uh, motivation to get stronger, uh, learn new skills in, in the gym and, and get better and really challenge myself as well. Um, so, so that, that's what kind of started my journey in the gym. And from there, enough people told me, Hey man, you should, you should be a trainer. You should be a coach. That was like, Oh, maybe I should be a trainer or coach, you know? So, uh, that's kind of started my, my career there. Um, but I've, I've, I've actually been lifting weights for, I would say about 15 years now. Uh, I'm 34 years old. I didn't really, really get, really get into it as far as like the, the muscle building hypertrophy until I was like 22. And, uh, now that I've, now I'm 34, I've been literally chasing bodybuilding for 10 years now. I did my first competition, uh, in 2014. And now I, I'm actually my last competition next year. Yeah. And for anybody who's not watching the video, like I know I've mentioned, I've done physique shows in the past, but it's like, there's big, which is like, I'd consider myself big. And then there's huge and there's Jace. So this is like different levels. Like he's that next elite level of like big, big kind of guy. <laughs> so now when it comes to the whole training aspect and like how you said you got into it and all, I'd love to start off on like when it comes to the myth side of things, because a lot of us get caught up in the stuff we see on social media and everything. Like, were there things that you did in the beginning and you're like, I want to build so much muscle, but you found out later that you're like, wow, that was a little bit of a waste of time. <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean, uh, I started in like the early two two thousands, right? And and uh, there wasn't much education going, going around then, at least as far as like the research side of, of uh, the fitness industry. So like we were just like, hey, like this guy's jacked. What did you do? You know, there's a lot of hearsay. Yeah. And, and back then, it wasn't social media either. So it was like, hey, like who's the biggest guy in your gym? All right, let's take his advice, right? Yeah. So or muscle so, and uh, fitness when they had like Branch Warren or Jay Cutler or Ronnie <laughs> Coleman. It's like, well, this is their leg day, not actually, but it totally is. <laughs> Yes, that's right. That's right. And I think just taking advice from like genetically elite people in general is like just the totally wrong thing to do, you know, but, uh, but uh, back then, again, it was just hearsay and, and you kind of just learned as you went. But what's really cool, man, is that over time, as you kind of build that intuitive training, it kind of does fit a mold that does back the research as well, you know, so she's been as, as I kept progressing my training, I, I got away from doing like a lot of intensifiers, a lot of drop sets, a lot of things that would cause too much fatigue. I got more precise and accurate with my training over time naturally. So where like now the research coming out like, hey, you know, uh, motor unit recruitment, fatigue management, uh, lift tense, lift tense relationship, you know, like these things are now lined up to build a model that we can actually progress from and, and, and learn the right way to get there faster. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think when it comes to the scientific side of things, it's so awesome that we have finally some research that like proves, okay, this works better than this. And more times than not, it is better or worse than it's not totally ineffective. So if somebody listening right now has been doing some of the stuff we talk about, it's still probably going to provide benefit. The number one thing that's going to facilitate results is your motivation. You know, so I prefer training. I I prefer training in like a four to eight rep range. You know, I want to limit fatigue. I want, I want to train heavier. I want I want to get in and get the result, not take too long the set. While like if you enjoy ten to fifteen reps, do that. You know, like, like you said, there's no there's no end all be all. There's there there is better ways. But if you, whatever you enjoy at the end of the day is be what you're going to train hard at. 
Absolutely. And I know, um, like me and Jace first met at real coaches summit in Vegas and I immediately went home and started following him, Elijah, and I'm listening to all your stuff. And I started experimenting with the four to eight and six, five to 10, six to 12. And I'm just like, I have finally started to grow some muscle noticeably. And it's like, okay, this stuff actually works. So when it comes to, like you said, four to eight, it's like a really solid range to stick to. Yeah. Now, what's the big benefit of sticking to that style of range? Like why not go crazy with like 20, 30, 40 repetitions? Yeah, so so uh, our body's always going to fight for homeostasis. So it's, its main goal is survival. So what, what a lot of people take, don't take in consideration is fatigue. So uh, no, knowing about um, uh, motor unit recruitment or how many muscle fibers you're recruiting in, in a set, uh, knowing about mechanical tension and, and the force velocity relationship, it's like we know that the more fatigued we are, the less units we recruit. So the less effective we're being there, you know. So almost think about fatigue being like this volume or dose. So if I can control that dose as much as possible with my sets by doing as little amount of volume as possible as being effective, and of course prioritizing the muscles I need to grow, I'm I'm, I'm going to be so much more effective there and also recover at a fast rate. Because essentially, if you can't recover from your training, it's not good train block. So I would say recovery is the number one variable in in your programming that needs to be considered before you even consider volume. Volume, part, you know, what muscles you're trying to grow, what moves you even want to do. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so what I'm getting at, what I'm getting from this is the fact that being sore 24 seven and being tired is not the goal. That's not the goal. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just wanted to, just wanted to clear things up because well, I know I mean, a lot of people do get stuck in that trap of, okay, zero rest, got to sweat, got to kill myself. And that's the way I get in shape. Yeah. Well, and, and don't be wrong. Like, I think people who kind of more in the adolescent um, level in their training, they they think soreness is, is a good metric. Like, oh, man, I'm sore. I'm, 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 I must do a workout. I must did some yesterday, you know, because it's an acute um, uh, response, you know. Well, like, we know that sore, I can get sore doing uh, a thousand box jumps or like a thousand jumping jacks, you know, but I built zero muscle there. I actually might do the opposite there, right? You know, so Let, uh, let's be yeah. honest. If any bodybuilder went for a jog, their calves would be ripped for the whole week. <laughs> They'd be wrecked. They'd be wrecked. So, so you know, the number one variable to us progressing over time, knowing that we're actually listening and muscle building response, is your numbers. As in, like you, you tracking your lifts makes sure you're progressing over time. Because essentially, you know, all, all those things I mentioned are important. But if there's no progressive overload aspect, you're not getting stronger over time. You, you're not really doing much. You know, so you're either performing at your best or below that. We'll actually perform above that over time and, and progress. Yeah. And I feel like that if it, if we were to dial it down to like the most simple thing in the entire world of, am I getting the result that I want is, are you actually getting stronger? Exactly. Simple. S cut and dry. Yep. Cause I mean, if we're going to get into the nitty gritty of like mechanical tension, for example, it's like, all that means is that you're lifting heavy enough. And if you do that and recover well enough, you're going to get stronger. Yep. 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 That's it. And, and, uh, and, um, and, and I got not to get too science centered guys. Uh, I, I am big in muscle physiology though. So it's hard for me to kind of dump some of these concepts down, but it's but, okay. But, I'll always chime in and be like, guys, <laughs> this means that. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. But but basically, when we get stronger, we're adding new muscle cells. We're adding new muscle tissue here, which, which is the goal of building muscle. Well, these muscle cells, com compared to other other uh, muscle cells in our body, they actually contract. They're called contractile uh, contractile muscle fibers. So when you think of contraction, you think of the muscle pulling together or shortening. So by us adding more shortening fibers, we're able to lift more weights or create uh, you know fight resistance over time further. So that's the whole goal: of progressive overload. We're trying to add new cells that actually contract. Yep. So now I know Elijah goes off on this a lot and it cracks me up listening to his stories, but the traditional thing that we all learned was break down your muscle fibers yes. and they'll build back up stronger. And I guess that would fall into what would be a myth right now. So yes. for anybody that wants like the newer, more improved, updated version of how we build muscle, like how would you explain that to them if they're like, no, I just got to keep tearing down? <laughs> well, first of all, like we don't actually build new, how can I say this? We don't create new muscle fibers, right? Our, our muscle fibers, our myofibr our myofibrils, uh, to be more exact, was like more granular fiber. It splits and creates new fiber, right? So we're just creating fibers from fibers here, which, which is really cool. But uh, the, the biggest thing that is it's actually a, a response your brain signals to that muscle. 
to that site. So for example, if I was to, if I was to do a curl for a thousand, again, a, a bunch of reps, I'm going to bring that muscle down as I'm, I'm a fatigue it, uh, cause some calcium ion influx to, to cause a lot of soreness and, and muscle damage. But uh, again, I'm not really creating a new response to grow. Well, if I have high muscle mechanical tension, like Brian said, with high muscle recruitment, my body's just sending a signal. Oh, Hey, he's actually, he's actually a lot from me right now. The, the stressor is very high. So let me split this muscle cell or muscle cells, so I say to create new contractile fibers to be stronger than next time he does it to me here okay so again it's not us tearing slight creating micro tears in the fibers and having to re rebuild back over time we don't want to tear muscles at all right it's uh, it's our brain sending a signal to that muscle to split the fiber and create new fibers they build them up over time yeah it's kind of like when you're forming bone like i mean we don't break bones down to build back stronger now when you break them do they come back stronger yes but when you lift heavy, your bones bend to a certain degree, and that sends a signal to your brain, hey, we got to create some more density down here. Otherwise, this is going to snap. Exactly. So it's kind of like pushing your body to that point of warning, yep. but not too far. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And it gets a little bit into the whole said principle, too, where it's like your body's going to adapt to whatever you give it. So it's Anybody who's like said what? I'm like specific adaptation to impose demand. So you give your body something, it will adapt if a lot of things are going right. And, and things that it can adapt from, you know, you mentioned about overtraining or doing a thousand reps or working out six, five, seven days a week. You know, what can you actually adapt from at that time based on, on the season, season of your life, based on your train program? If it's, if it's, if it's, you know, again, uh, very strenuous or very taxing, you know, so making sure that all those variables come to play, which is really why we need coaches, you know, like you yeah. literally need somebody to say, Hey, look, here, here's your ball feedback. Here's your, you know, your stress, your energy levels, your, your digestion, here's your pictures. Here's your, here's your training plan. How can we progress this over time here? You know, and not just mm -hmm. hit it with sledgehammer. We kind of course the body to give us more muscle and less body fat over time. Yeah. You really just need that unbiased third party to like call you out on your own bullshit because everybody's a little bit too far on the spectrum one way or the other. They either take it way too easy or they usually go way too hard. And then a coach is usually able to bring you a little bit closer to the middle. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know myself, I'll push it way too hard and burn myself out and then get no results <laughs> and be like, damn, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and at the end of the day, training is fun, man. You know, like yeah. if, you, if you want people, like it's not a task. It's something you actually enjoy doing, you know, it's like, it's hard, not, it's hard to pull back when it's something you enjoy doing, you know? So, but that's also why I have like my clients get hobbies. I'm like, Hey, what did you enjoy doing when you're younger? <laughs> Was it like playing Frisbee or like skateboarding? Like, let's, let's add this into our, our, our daily, our weekly, you know, um, 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 uh, schedule so that we can actually have other things to do outside of the gym that we are active and having fun with. Absolutely. And before we get away from the gym, because I know that there's a lot of stuff that happens outside the gym that's just as important. I know that at Apex, you guys seem like you've got this down packed, which is community and environment, which yes. I think a lot of people don't understand the gigantic impact that can make. Yep. Yep. I mentioned uh, motivation earlier, right? That could also be your community and, and your environment as well. So uh, our, our goal when we built the gym, man, uh, I mean, this is a vision we had since we started, was to have a place where people could come in and, and, and feel at home to train hard, but also to feel like energy where there's like loud music, there's fun machines, there's cool colors, you know? So it, you're automatically simulated from when we first walk in there, you know? Because we've all been that gym before where you're like, is this a library? Like, why is it so quiet in here? Like, or like you're training and people are looking at you weird. You're like, why is it looking at me weird? Like, I'm training hard or something, you know? So like, I should be asked like, why are you training so hard? Or like, like, what do you do for a living? You know, like it should be a norm for you to go to gym and train, you know, but unfortunately those niche gyms aren't common, especially like, I guess like more rural state or more rural areas. Um, but, but if you do have access to like a bodybuilding gym or a local gym, try to get in there, get in the community. Cause normally you're finding more serious people in that gym rather than a big box gym where everybody's paying 15 bucks a month and don't really care about each other or the, or the, or the uh, environment. Exactly. And I'm, I'm saying this as somebody that literally had to realize, hey, at home gym is awesome, but it's not the same. You need something to go to to separate. Like, I, I swear to God, it's like we kind of learned this in COVID where it's like your home is for rest, sex and sleep. Like everything else should be out of your house. <laughs> like you yes. that's like your your cave, but it's not like where you should be all the time. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's why people have trouble working from home, right? Because yeah. home, you're like laundry, 
nap, you know, uh, uh, food. But when you go to work, you naturally your, your mind's already turning. Like, okay, well, let me get in work mode. You know, so when you go to the gym, you want your cells to start clicking. Like, oh, he's about to put me through a lot of stress. Let me turn my body on. Let me let me get this mitochondria proliferate, proliferate a lot faster here, so I can convert energy more. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I know some people do struggle, like they don't have that community that is readily available to them. But luckily, with the online communities, like it's not quite the same, but it's like a step in the right direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And because so, if you go home and like, you know, your family members or friends are eating pizza and fried chicken, it's gonna be hard to stick to your program or, or, or even to be motivated to follow anything structured um, outside of that environment because it's, it's what you're around all the time, it's what you're exposed to, you know? So I feel like us people who are in fitness or have been doing this for a long time, it's hard for us to really get like empathy towards that because we've been, you know, our lives are really structured around around health and fitness, you know? So to take somebody who's in that environment and slowly kind of, kind of like change their mindset, that the identity of themselves is one of the hardest parts coaching absolutely and it kind of gets into the whole like i think i came across one of your posts about how it's like your lifestyle should be surrounded by fitness or your like or vice versa where it's like literally fitness should always be kind of part of the equation and that's how you keep the results that's how you get the results in the first place yeah, yeah. You, I call it censoring your life. Like you want to censor your life amongst like things that that are non negotiables, things that you don't want to be a part of, or or part of your values either. You know that can go to your family, your spiritual life, and everything else. Yeah, and I think one of the big shifts that a lot of people experience for the first time when they get healthy, when they start really prioritizing all that, is like that moment that you have when you're out to dinner and you see somebody get a dish that has zero protein in it, and you're like, "Yes, <laughs> what? <laughs> what?" <laughs> Like somebody gets a pasta dish with no meat and you're like, no meat. Ugh, that like hurts. <laughs> yes. What do you mean? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. But um, bef again, before we get out of the gym, I want to go over one big thing that I think is like most people, str they don't struggle with this. They don't really grasp the concept of it. And I think it leaves a lot of results on the table. And that's the difference between working and warm up sets because I think a lot of people just show up and they're like, all right, I did my sets. They felt hard, but what gives? I'm not really seeing any difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to define the difference between warm up and working sets is a working set uh, for, as, as in terms of hypertrophy, if it goes to build muscle, is that a working set is close to failure. And what failure is, it's not literally you you having the bar drop on your chest or you failing, you know, it, it's uh, it's actually a rep speed. So we want to see that concentric speed. So if you're doing a, a press, for example, on the way up from your chest to above, above your shoulders here, we want to see a rep speed actually cut in half. Because that means that, I, I mentioned mechanical tension earlier, that means that the force velocity relationship, the force of your muscle cells and the velocity of, of the bar, the movement is, 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 uh, is, is cross bridging uh, at, at a high rate. So you're actually creating that response to build muscle there. So so uh, again, we're trying in a working sense, we're trying to get to a place where the rep speed slows down. Uh, and if, if you don't reach that, or if you don't attain that, you're not training close to failure. You're stopping because it's hard or you feel burned, not because, again, you're, you're actually getting close to failure. Yeah, I think a lot of people get a little confused when it comes to the whole eccentric side of things. And for anybody that doesn't know that eccentric thing is usually the lowering like in a squat or like letting the bar come up on a lat pull down where it's like that for some reason, people are like, oh, if I go slow, I'll gain a lot of muscle when it's not quite right, where it's like you should be doing your absolute hardest, but you're involuntarily slowing down. Exactly. That, that, that's what I was looking for. Involuntary. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 Because that's how you know you're putting in the most effort. It's like your body physically won't let you go as fast as the first rep. That's right. That's right. And, and to further expand on, on the, the warm ups as well, a warm up is any set outside that. Right. So let's literally, literally my goal in a warm set is just to prime my body, my nervous system to handle a heavier load so I can be close to failure. So if you're again, if you're not if you're training and you're not getting close to failure, that would be either considered junk volume as volume that's not not productive to our goal is all at all or a warm up. Yep. And that's why, like, I know when Jace, when you post things up, it's like, oh, it's only two sets of this and one set set of this. And anybody looking would be like, what? <laughs> like, that's it. And I think a lot of people miss the intention side of things. Yeah. Well, well, so uh, I I only do about eight to nine sets of workouts, right? And people are like, man, eight to nine sets, that's super low volume. <laughs> volume Not is if it's the dose. Dorian way. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we have to look at volume as like a dose, right? Like if I'm yeah. taking ibuprofen, you know, if I'm taking 40 milligrams or five, I'm taking a thousand, probably not fine there, you know, because the dose is high. So, so or for volume, we want, we want to take a, a an, an accurate dose. Okay. What do I need to actually create a response to, to grow and recover from? So like, um, you mentioned doing one or two sets. If if that stimulus is high enough within those two sets and, and a third set would be productive, I'm going to shut it down there, you know, because I don't want to keep doing sets if I'm going to continue getting weaker. So my first set, if I stop at a good uh, at a good RPE or uh, rate of reps in reserve, I should be in a good place to have my second set just as close. If I do a third set and it was even if it was close to my first second, I didn't go hard enough my first second set there, you know. So again, our goal is to get in, boom, create that stimulus, move on to the next exercise. Yeah. So say somebody's following the tips that they're hearing right now and they're like, all right, I'm going to do that four to eight rep range, striving for eight. And they get eight on that first working set. On that second set, what do you think would be like a good number to know, okay, this was productive or this wasn't productive? Yeah. So, uh, so how can I say this? So uh, an, an effective rep or an effective rep to grow again is when that rep speed slows down here, you know, so they could literally do one rep and it'll be effective, right? Like, oh man, I went too heavy. It's like, actually, no, that, that went to, towards that, that effective volume we're trying to accomplish here, you know, but I would say uh, have like, have like a rep range. Um, I think again, four to eight, four to 10 is actually ideal for most people. So if you got eight, the first set, Hey, next set, let's get, let's get six or seven. Right. So you're staying within mm -hmm. that, that prescribed rep range. We're trying to stay within to control the weight and, uh, and, and, you know, have a good tempo and everything else, but you're not going over under that. You know, some people like doing, I like doing eight and 20 reps. I'm like, why are you doing 20 reps? You know? So it's like, you know, you at that point, because, because again, weight doesn't cause fatigue reps cause fatigue. Meaning if I do five heavy reps, I'm going to be a lot more fresh than if I did 20 light reps. Right. So because there's other fatiguing variables in there, like your cardiovascular system, body temperature, et cetera. So uh, us training in, in, in a lower rep range and training well with good quality is always the goal. Exactly. And it's the same on the other end of the spectrum too, right? Where it's like, you got like these Bulgarian power lifters that are like literally having to rest 10 minutes between sets. Cause they're doing sets of one with like thousands of pounds. So it's like that middle range, that four to 10 is like that sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, I mean, and also like, if you're like a kind of like pessimistic about what we were saying here, try yourself, you know, go to the gym, yeah. do 12 reps or do, do five heavy reps and just how you feel afterwards, you know, which, which one do you feel better on and which one do you feel more productive here, you know, but also, um, we're, we're, we're taking this lightly here. Training heavier is, is actually a skill, you know? So for example, if I learned to do an, uh, an RDL, okay. Doing a 10 rep RDL or doing a five rep RDL are completely two ball games. I would say that it might even take eight months to a year to learn how to go to five reps here, you know? So, uh, again, for a lot of stuff we're saying here in, in the heavy rep range, that's more for advanced people. If you're a beginner, you're like one to two to three years in gym and you're still not confident like exercises, stay in that higher rep range because you're going to get a bigger ROI doing that with, with, the, with your, again, your ability to brace and stay stable, but also your ability to even connect to the movement because I'm doing four or eight reps, but I'm connecting to high level while you might do four and eight be like no, i didn't feel I, I, didn't, I didn't that that, that felt like crap you know my, my back hurts now right so you know those those like i said those bracing mechanisms over time and that my must connection over time is what builds from you just simply doing uh, more more repetitions exactly because that whole concept of practice like getting yep. actually good at the movement so you actually get something out of it is huge and that's something that you don't see a lot on social media because everybody's like if you do the perfect mechanics on this specific thing with this immediate line of pull then everything's going to work out when it's like your brain has not made those connections it has no no i see i, I mean you, you you train people in person as well right uh yeah i have a handful Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. You, you've had somebody uh, grab the 30 pound dumbbells and it's awesome. They get like 10 or 12, you know? I will yep. grab 35, it's five pounds heavier and it's a mess. You're like, oh, wow. Oh, that was, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, they just haven't built that neur neur neuromuscular connection with, that, that, with the weight, weight yet, you know? So, and, and the only reason we're strong is from our brain sending that signal to our peripheral nervous system to output force, but also output stability. So, if it's unstable, it's not actually down regulate. It's, 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 it's a power, you know? So, they might actually be stronger and, and again, be, be, be more productive in a lower weight, higher rep range there, simply from that factor. Exactly. And then honestly, again, from hearing you talk about this, from hearing Elijah talk about this, like I kind of expanded on that a little bit with my own clients and was like, we're going to do what's called the double up rule, like five to 10. When you can get 10, you go up in weight. Yes. And that way you get the best of both worlds. Like you get up in five pounds and you're like, listen, you don't have to do 10. Yeah. Let's just get five. Yep. And then they're like, oh, simple enough. And then for some reason, that confidence factor actually seems to improve the coordination a little bit. 
Exactly. And ultimately that's, that's going to allow you to progress the weights over time further, you know, because if you, if you're staying, let's say, let's say like I'm coaching a, a middle-aged woman, you know, and she's pressing 35s on incline, which is very good. Right. And, but we're saying within that 10 to 12 rep range, we don't have much room to go up. We don't have much room to go down either, you know. So yeah. us training into four to eight, that could, that could be a ten pound jump in on on the dumbbells, you know. So and and if we could like soak as much progress possible from every weight before we move up or or move down, that would be the go there. Yeah, yeah. It just comes down to just getting good at it and just the repetition of it all. Because when you can do that, that's when you start seeing the differences. Yeah, I think a lot of people, or like I said, social media, they kind of water down training to where it's like this simple thing, you know. But like, you know, if, if me and you start doing Pilates, how long takes to get good, good Pilates? A few months. <laughs> that would that would probably take me like a year. I'm, oh, I'm okay. not good with that stuff. <laughs> well, like you know, Pilates, yoga, like these things were these group yeah. classes, right? You know, even like let's, let's even go like Orange Theory, for example. You know, I hate class. You know, it doesn't take much thought process to really uh, uh, to nail all these movements here. You know, it takes it takes a few reps there. You know, while training, man. Oof, it takes, I would say it takes about five years to really get an idea of what's going on to, to build skill in every movement, build skill in every machine and, and then progress it from there, you know? So it really is a skill that takes a lot of focus. And if you're going to show up to the gym and mindlessly lift, you, you will not get stronger. You will not get better. Yeah. And I think it gets back to how you were talking about how like the five reps is so much different than the 10 reps. Cause like in those situations with the group classes or just like doing your own thing, you get really good at the rhythm of it. And you're like, okay, this should look a certain way. This should feel a certain way. And then when you get to that point where you get really good, like say four or five years in, you're like, this is what like five singles feel like, where it's yeah. like, that's the difference between just going, going, going and being like, all right, one really solid one, two really solid <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Uh, another thing holds a lot of people back from going heavier is, is the ability to brace, right? Mm -hmm. So, so them not breathing correctly and telling their body, Hey, stay calm with this heavier weight, especially on like your heavier lifts, like a leg press or a hack squat, you know, uh, them, them not breathing well and bracing well, like, but, but of course their, 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 uh, their extremities as what holds a lot of people back. Cause they'll just come down and, and you know, it's every time they have to stop at the top, you're like, why are you stopping at the top every time? You know, and it's cause they're not bracing well. He doesn't feel good. So the body wants to stop and reset there, you know, but if you learn how to breathe and brace and, and, and get tight the way down, you can actually get those back-to-back -back reps, make it really smooth set of four or five that you, you train a failure, but you're, you're, you're not, it's not, it's not a car wreck the entire time. It's not a fight the entire time. You just, you just, you, you literally just seamlessly going up and down um, cause you're creating that tightness early on for the set. Yeah. And I think when people see like, say, amateur powerlifters, for example, you see that all the time where people will do one rep and then, oh, got to catch my breath a little bit here and then redo it. And it's one of those learned skills where if you've been an experienced bodybuilder, you could do like eight reps while staying tight. And yes. it's one of those skills that you just got to learn. Yes, yes. And, and, you know, that's why we want to air towards more machines or like stable skilled movements because a barbell is a 100% skilled movement, right? Like mm -hmm. nobody's actually trained a true failure with a barbell simply because of the stability factor, right? So it's like them, it's understandable, hey, stop, reset every single rep here. You know, we're trying to have execution here. You know, if I want a hack squad, what do I really have to think about? What do I really have to brace? My feet? Um, you know, my, 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 my knees away, you know, like there's, there's not much of a thing about a brace. So we can really create that tension with high loads to get better reps and, and better, better execution. Yeah. Machines are definitely one of those things I changed my mind on in the last couple of years, because I came from a gym that was very functional yeah. <laughs> and yeah. there's a lot of value in that. But at the same time, like when you're trying to go all in on muscle, it's stability is the name of the game, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and machines help us achieve certain angles. Uh, that we couldn't achieve otherwise. So, for example, like with a barbell, I, I have a longer femur, shorter torso. I'm gonna I'm gonna use more lower rectors, right? I'm, I'm gonna use my back and not mm -hmm. my legs as much there. Well, if I do a hack squat or pendulum squat, I'm gonna literally touch my hamstrings, my calves, and I, I can never achieve that otherwise. But also, there's some called a strength curve, and, and basically means that between on the machine you're using, it might be uh, heavier at the top and lighter, lighter at the bottom of the movement there. So uh, naturally, uh, if I'm doing like a row, for example, and I'm pulling, I got my pecs, my serratus, my 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 scap working for me, my lat working for me. But as I'm pulling it closer to my rib cage, I'm actually just having my lat working for me. So naturally, I'm going to be just weaker because I'm only using one muscle there. So most machines offer that strength curve, which is more natural with, with your natural motion. So so you actually, again, have better tension, get more reps, and, and, and of course, build more muscle more, in a more stable environment. Yeah. Yeah. And for anybody listening that's like, how do I maximize the strength curve? And you're like one year in, don't worry about it. Do not worry about that. <laughs> don't worry about it just yet. <laughs> you get, there's always time to nerd out later. Just get good yes. at what you're doing right now. <laughs> yes. Yes. Make it feel good. Have fun.
Yes. Yes. <laughs> now I know we, t- we touched on like a lot of stuff when it comes to inside the gym and I'd love to yeah. talk about outside the gym and yeah. how you, I want to start with how you talked about hobbies being a big thing, because especially in the fitness industry, we're all meatheads. We love being in the gym and it's like, all right, so what else is there to life? <laughs> Cause we kind of get caught up in, and I see it on my own clients too, where it's like, it's all diet nutrition yeah. and, or it's diet exercise and work and family. And that's it. There's nothing else when it comes to finding like what to do with that extra space. What are some of your favorite things that clients have done or that you've suggested over the years? Well, so let me first take it back here. So, you know, back in before 2020s, you could be a macro coach and like, Hey, here's macros. Here's your training. All right, good, go, you know, and, and people pay a high dollar for that. And they were happy, you know, well, nowadays, as the, the fitness industry gets more saturated, the value for your coaching has gone up tremendously. You know, I, I am a, a I'm a life coach. I'm a mindset coach. I am a hormone specialist coach, right? You know, like we yep. have to wear so many hats nowadays because we won't be a one-stop shop. So that, that we, we, we can solve those problems that previously couldn't solve otherwise here, you know? So one of those things is mindset. So um, uh, uh, I, I work with a lot of uh, high-level people, whether it be you know, entrepreneurs or people with high-level careers, and finding the place where our schedule matches our goals is our number one goal right there, right? Because literally, if, if we're if we're spreading ourselves thin or we have an unstable um, uh, schedule, it's, it's not going to work over time. So... Uh, um, so one, once that established, then I'm like, okay, well, look, where's your rest time? Where's your recharge times? You know, because if we're just burning the can at both ends all day, by the time <laughs> by the time six o'clock comes and you need to go home to your family or you're just going home, there's no there's nothing left. We're not, we're not gonna be the, the, the parent, the person won't be there. You know, so um, uh, tell uh, reiterating the client of how important like doing things you enjoy outside the gym and outside your work and outside your family is important to keep their mental health, their emotional health stable is, is the main goal. So. Um, how do I help find that for them? I, I you know, ask them, hey, what, what, what did you do when you're younger? Right. So again, it, it might, it, it might be, uh, it might be playing frisbee. It might be skateboarding, you know, for me or skateboarding. Okay. So, uh, so recently I found myself in the gym 24 seven, I built a gym here in Louisiana, um, about six months ago, I'm in the gym all day, like literally at the gym all day, you know, I was like, I need to get out of here, dude. You know, like it's, it's running well with that without me. <laughs> yeah, that, it's a meathead dream in the beginning. And you're just like, all right, I got to get out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it wasn't bad, but I just, I just felt like, Hey, I, I need some other hobbies here, you know? And one thing too, yeah. is like, uh, I won't get too too far on topic, but I'm 34 years old. Life's passing by super fast now, dude. Like literally, like it, we're we're already halfway through a year, and I'm like, dude, it was just a new year here, you know. So uh, uh, one way to slow life down is to learn new skills and to have fun in, in different things that we don't normally do there. Because we're just stuck in our routine of our job or the routine of our family. It's gonna fly by here, you know. So uh, I encourage the people to learn new hobbies, learn new skills. It really helps life slow down. It also creates that that, that uh, higher. Um, quality of life, which is really cool for us. But again, what did you enjoy when you're doing your younger? Most likely you kind of have some interest when you're older. It could be even a, be a fan of the sport. For example, like let's say you play, you play soccer. So, okay, well, I'm going to actually go play soccer in the field, but let me just go, watch, you know, I mean, it, go, go watch some games or keep up with the players or whatever, whatever's going on that time there, you know? So again, helping them kind of find that avenue and then and exploring it and, and, and find that in their schedule is, is the goal there. Yeah. And I think that gets into a little bit how like when we, get past a certain age, all of a sudden the concept of play is gone. Gone. And that part of our brain just stops working. And it's such an invaluable thing to bring it back as we get older. I mean, having kids and all is like definitely something that can help with that because you got to play, but adult play is like a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. And and we have to have an outlet to be creative. And to be and to be and to progress, you know. So that's why physique enhancement is so fun. You know, I, I'm a physique enhancement coach. So it's like we could literally progress your physique and be creative and how we build it, and what we do in the gym, everything else there, you know. But it's a very very slow process. Like you know, what one of the myths we're talking about earlier was uh, women um, in the gym they're scared to build muscle. Like, hey, I won't get too bulky. I don't want to get too jacked. It's like I promise you will not. First of all, but but uh, but also uh, us having the outlet to build muscle, and within two years we have a decent base. It's like a real, a real, real expectation of muscle building over time. How, and how awesome is that? Like, I wish I could go back to the newbie phase of like, listen, you're going to make incredible progress in that first year or two. And that's pretty much going to be like 90% of your foundation. And you're going to be like chasing pennies after that. And it's like, oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, well, and, and earlier we we're talking about, uh, you know, optimization here. You know, I, I know a lot of people who, who've been training for, you know, five, 10 years. No, I mean, I, I don't track my training. I just, I just go to gym and lift. And I'm like, okay, so you haven't made progress in five or 10 years, literally, because yeah. you know, you're not being precise, you know, because again, you're either exactly. operating at your best or below that there. So the longer you do things, the more precise you have to get to, like I said, two pinch for pennies in that progress muscle. Because at this point, I'm scratching for ounces. I'm like, come on, body, give me an ounce here. <laughs> yeah, that's why I crack up when, when everybody's like, well, if I do this style of training, I'm going to get so bulky. And I'm like, listen, like there's people right now that are clawing for like one pound of muscle per month. Yes, literally. <laughs> and if, and if you're losing a pound a week, four pounds in a month, and you're gaining one pound of muscle, you're going to look a hell of a lot better. And you're yep. going to feel a hell of a lot better. Yep. And you're going to be technically smaller. Yep. That's exactly. But also people don't realize how much one pound of muscle even a year looks like. It does yeah. make a difference. You know, and of course, what, what, what physique enhancement is about is about building muscle and losing fat over time. So basically you go through a growth phase to build as much muscle possible, progress in PRs. But then once a year, once every other year, you do a fat loss phase to, to see that muscle. So if you're one, two, three pounds heavy, you're like, man, it's like a different person here, you know? So you know, uh, we, we don't we really want to compare progress to pounds and muscle because, again, one pound can make a huge difference. Or, or five pounds in the wrong place can make a small difference, you know? Yeah. And especially like in that phase that we're talking about, that first year, you could get away with just recomping. You could not gain or lose a, a single pound and completely change your body and completely change your health. Which can be very frustrating for some people, right? <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah. They look at the scale and they're like, screw yes. this. I may look and feel amazing, but screw this. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I, I have a few clients right now, man. Uh, you know, we did their second fat loss phase and I would say it takes two fat loss phases to get in a, in a great spot. You know well, I mean? Great spot is, is more of your body composition for body fat because you have as much muscle as possible, you know, but if you can't see the muscle, you're not too happy. So I, I have clients right now, like women who are like in the, you know, 14 to 18% to body fat range. Like they have abs, they look great. Mm -hmm. so they have muscle caps, you know, but it's like, Hey, now it's build muscle. You know, it's like every update's like, hey, keep going. You're doing great. You know, so uh, it, it's definitely a lot more, uh, I would say, not boring, but definitely monotonous. But it, it, that's that's when we make the most progress to your physique, you know. Exactly. When you can get to the boring phase, that's how you know you've made yeah. it. It, it. Exactly. That's exactly right. Like, hey, we, we don't need to cut for any reason at all. We're in a great spot. We're like two yeah. weeks out from vacation or two weeks out from, you know, a pile for meat. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, on the like body composition side of things, when it comes to nutrition, what are some of the key concepts you like to make sure clients get down packed? And you're just like, listen, if we do X, Y, and Z, that's going to fuel this whole operation. Yeah, man. I think that, well, I, I would first start with the biggest mistake I see. I, I think people, they try to progress in, in some type of phase too early. So let's say, let's say they're coming in, they don't have any ba base or foundation. They're like, Hey, I want to lose fat. Well, here's a fat loss phase, you know, or, or Hey, I want to build muscle. Well, here's a surplus, you know, what, when, what, when you always fall back on something, you know, over time. So if you don't build that good foundation of being optimal in all areas, you know, energy, stress, sleep, strength, et cetera, you're, 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 you're setting yourself for failure because what you can't progress that from there, you know? So, so if we could build, I, I always have clients come in and I call it an optimization phase, the first, you know, 12 to, to, to 12 weeks to 24 weeks. And really was optimizing. Like I said, we're recomping, we're building muscle, losing body fat through better sleep, better, better, better habits, better self-talk. Um, and, and from there, it's like, okay, what, what do we need to do next? What does this physique need over time? Do we need to lose fat? Do we build muscle? So after that, we progress into that next phase, but we have that foundation to fall back on. Yeah. And it's interesting how like, I mean, you coach some high, high level people that are like in insane shape and it still comes down to the basics of like, let's sleep enough. Let's get enough food. <laughs> like let's manage stress. Yes. You know, it's funny, you know, like they, they come up with these big goals, you know, and, and I try to tell me, Hey, let's just focus on the small things, focus on your sleep, your stress management, your water intake, your sleep, your steps, you know, uh, and, and your meals, of course. And, and they're like, man, well, I want to lose fat. I'm like, Hey, if we focus on that, what's going to happen? The byproduct is fat loss. The bad byproduct is muscle gain there, you know? So if you can shift their mm -hmm. focus on the process and not the product, you know, because essentially we're selling, we're selling a service. Uh, you hire me for a, for a process through that process. We get, we get the, the, the goal you want, the product, you know, but essentially if we just focus on, on optimizing that process over time, we're going to get there plus on uh build on top of that over time. Exactly. Cause I, I think it's just human nature. You just get obsessed with the outcome where it's like, I exactly. want this now. I like pr it's literally prime day as we're filming this. It's like prime now. I want it like yesterday. Yep. 
Yep. But you got to become like a fiend and obsessed with the actual things that get you the outcome. Exactly. And as a coach, man, you know, if your coach is not preaching about the process or falling in love with the process or whatever about the process, oof, it, it, it's, it's a temporary coach. You know, yeah. like I, if, 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 if at the end of uh, my time with a client, they say, hey, Jace, like I actually enjoyed, you know, tracking my, my steps and my my sleep and, you know, uh, get, you know, getting meals and feeling satiated and not hungry all day. You know, I'm like, boom, we're good. I, I did my job there, you know, whether we have the result or not. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I mean, we, we covered a lot and I definitely want to make sure that you have time to relax and get right for leg day. But I got one final question for you yeah. before we wrap up. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. So we always end on one question that is left from the previous guest for the next guest without having a clue who they're going to be. Ooh. Okay. So, so, so we're going question first, then my question. Yeah, I'll get I'll okay. get your question off air so that way everybody knows oh, to okay. tune in gotcha, next gotcha, time gotcha, to gotcha. find out. Awesome. Yes. But this one comes from Coach Melissa Shevchenko. She um is the Fit Girls Rock owner and she's an incredible coach herself. And she asked, if you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? Oof. I would either say the ability to fly, because I hate driving, I hate flying. <laughs> so I can get places or the ability to control time. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Cause if I, cause so many times I'm like, hey, if I just stop time right now, that'd be so great. You know? So I, I would say time is probably the number one priority for sure. Love that. Yeah, yeah. I would totally take teleportation. Like if I never had to drive <laughs> or take a plane or a train anywhere ever again, I would be the happiest person in the entire yeah, world. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's funny, man. My, my wife, like she, 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 we, we travel a lot. She, I mean, she loves vacations, loves everything else, you know, and she could drive eight hours without blinking. Like she's going to the grocery store. She's like sitting there driving, you know, me like after two hours, dude, I start getting claustrophobic. I'm like, get me out of this car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I can do it. Like I've got to drive from North Carolina where I'm at right now to Jersey tomorrow. Oof. So that's a, that's a eight hour clip right there. If you oh, have a good yeah. book to listen to, if you got some good podcasts yes. like this one, um, then you are set. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys say simulated. It's like cardio. It's like the further I can get away from doing cardio and like focus on like this media I have or, or whatever else, like the better it feels for sure. Exactly. Exactly. You just got to go off somewhere else. That's enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Cool. Well now if anybody listening right now is like, damn, Jace is one intelligent dude. He's a, like a breath of fresh air. I want to see him on my feed. Like where can they find you? So first of all, I hope you guys got that from this because a lot of times on <laughs> podcasts I do, I'm like, Jesus, Jay, so bad. But uh, no, that's, that's great. Uh, as far as uh, Instagram, I'm probably the most active there. Um, and my my, uh, my tag is uh, Jace underscore Lopez underscore. Uh, I have a website and everything else. But if you just go to my Instagram, you can kind of find everything else there. Cool. And everybody, don't bother going searching. It's all going to be down in the show notes in the description. You can just click away and find Jace. Now, the only ask is that if you guys at any point heard anything where you're like, wow, that was awesome. Or you have that friend who's just trying to get started, or they're really scared of getting too bulky, go ahead and send this their way. So they get all the info that they need and tell them that Brian and Jace say hi. All right. But <laughs> until next time, go kick some ass. I'll see you later. <laughs>